Welcome to Microsoft Pride 2022. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are thrilled that you are here with us. In the metaverse, in 2D and 3D, watching on YouTube live or watching the recording, we welcome you exactly as you are. Thank you for joining us for our yearly tradition, a gathering of LGBTQIA plus leaders, employees from around the world, talking about intersectionality and the state, the queer world. This year, we reflect on how pride has no borders. And you can see around me, it truly has none, not physically, not digitally. And to capture that spirit, we created this video. Let's take a look at some of the beautiful voices from around the world. In a country where you have that freedom of speech. In a country where you have that freedom of speech, I think one of the most detrimental things that you can do is not use your voice. My name's Dylan Mooney. I'm a, a Yui man from Queensland, and I'm a visual artist. I started using queer Indigenous characters in my works. It was just me exploring my identity more. Pride is us holding these spaces for ourselves. We're giving ourselves agency to tell our own stories. My name is Elsa and I'm an author. So I was born in India but grew up in Ghana and South Africa. That fire for social justice was instilled in me in a really young age. I made a connection pretty early on between storytelling and activism. By telling stories, we really become aware of how our different struggles are interconnected. My name's Jamie and I'm the co-founder at a nonprofit called InReach. I grew up in a more religious environment and I didn't meet any openly LGBTQ people until I was in my early 20s. We use technology to match LGBTQ people with the safe resources that they need. A refugee and asylum is an LGBTQ issue. If we don't take action, we're missing members of our global community who haven't had the opportunity and that freedom just to live authentically. I'm Aisha, I'm a veteran, and I work at Microsoft as a program manager. Being in the military is the opportunity to really travel, and I found queer community all over the world. When I hear pride has no borders, it really means that you are not alone where the global pride community comes into play. Action in one place can spark impact in other places. Resistance is resistance. Being alive today is resistance. There's one of you, but I promise you there's a community of us just like you. As we honor 52nd Annual Pride, we wanted to take you back using the magic of VR to see where our contemporary movement started. Oh, we're gonna hop in the teleporter, because that's how we roll in alt space, and we're gonna travel all the way back to Christopher Street. Welcome to the roots of Pride. This is Christopher Street, which has been the center of the LGBTQ plus movement since the historic uprising at the Stonewall Inn, or just Stonewall as it was often called. It was a bar and it had been raided many times because at the time in New York, it was illegal to serve alcohol to anyone who was gay or even suspected of being gay. But on June 28th, 1969, the bar patrons resisted the raid and crowds formed outside to join in the protests. The resistance continued over several days and it spilled into Christopher Park over here. Christopher Park was a hangout and often a refuge for gay street youth. Many of them were homeless because they had been exiled from their families. At the peak of the Stonewall uprising, there were several thousand people filling this area that we're recreating here. Now, the magic of the metaverse lets us add touchstones into the past. So the video screens near Stonewall 
show the first Pride Parade in 1970, which was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. And if you walk over in the path along the park and a few places along the street here, there are several rings that give you audio flashbacks to the voices of the Pride Movement. We encourage you to come and explore them and also check out the timeline that shows key moments in the movement. This world is going to be open to everyone from Microsoft. You can use the teleporter from the celebration space to come here. And then on June 17th, we're gonna open the space to everyone in the world. We encourage everyone to come by, listen, reflect, celebrate how far we've come, and think about how far we still have to go for global LGBTQI plus rights. Welcome to Microsoft Pride 2022. Hello, everyone. My name is Eleanor, and welcome to Pride 2022. I'll be one of your hosts, along with my wonderful co-host, Chris. And I hope all of you are enjoying this stunning VR space created by our amazing team. So even though we aren't physically together, we're still able to congregate and celebrate in this virtual world. Happy Pride, everyone. We are so excited to see you here in this big Pride world. This space and Christopher Street will continue to be available after this event for everyone to enjoy. So we encourage you to take it in. It will be a living museum and an event space, so be sure to check it out. The theme for this year's Pride is Pride Has No Borders, and Iasia and Alexi are some of the people behind Pride this year. So I'm going to pass it off to Iasia. Can you tell us more about what Pride Has No Borders mean? Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Eleanor. So Pride at Microsoft is created by and with the LGBTQIA plus communities, and our goal is to drive inclusion forward. In selecting this, this year's idea, we reflected on the challenges we faced. You know, they're multi-dimensional. War, racism, attracts, uh, attacks on trans and queer rights, ecological crisis, attacks on women's health and reproductive health, injustices that we see every day. All of these issues are connected, and to solve them, we need to have a coordinated global intersectional response. Thank you, Ayesha. That's why we're coming together across borders. And that's why we're saying that Pride theme is Pride has no borders. Because wherever you look around us, we can build on each other. And if we work together across communities, we can make change for LGBTQIA plus people and beyond. Our struggles are interconnected. And that's why they require an interconnected and global response. That's what we're talking about today at this event, throughout the events in June, but also every single day of the year. Back to you, Chris and Eleanor. Thank you, Ayesha and Alexi. So, what are we going to talk about today, Eleanor? <laughs> Glad you asked. So first, we'll visit our LGBTQIA plus community from Gleam chapters around the world. Then we'll hear from Team Xbox LGBTQIA plus about visibility and representation in gaming. And we'll close today with conversations with folks from Outright Action International and IGLAUN about the state of the queer world. So you don't want to miss that. So please stay with us until the very end. Wow, that's a lot for today. So everyone, buckle up for these next two hours. And if you're asking, this event is just one of the many ways we honor and celebrate LGBTQIA plus communities. And now for our next video, let's hear from our chief marketing officer and a huge ally, Chris Cap Capitella. Well, hey everybody. I'm so glad you're able to join us for today's event. Here at Microsoft, we stand for supporting the greater good, which includes centering LGBTQIA plus people and their voices. As a company, we have a proud history of advocacy. Way back in 1989, we added sexual orientation into our non-discrimination policies. In 1993, we began offering employee benefits for same-sex domestic partnerships, making us one of the very first companies in the world to do so. Today, our LGBTQIA plus community is present in over 60 locations and in 30 countries around the world. I'm so proud to see our pride celebrations have grown from a few hundred people marching in Seattle to billions of Microsoft customers receiving our messages of LGBTQIA plus inclusion and support every single year. Microsoft stands with the LGBTQIA plus community and our commitment is stronger than ever before. By supporting our employees through global advocacy, charitable giving, and better workplace practices, we're hoping to make a difference for LGBTQI plus communities and beyond. 
In recognition of pride, we're contributing $170,000 to LGBTQI plus nonprofits around the world. That's in addition to the $8 million we've donated together with our employees since just last year. Unfortunately, we are continuing to see injustices impacting the LGBTQI plus community. In response to this, this year we're inviting everyone to take action and join in on the calls for justice and equity for all across all borders, whether they're geographical, societal, or ideological. We believe there's no town too small or no village too remote to honor pride. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I hope we all continue to listen and learn from each other during this Pride Month and every other day of the year as well. I look forward to continuing to make change together. Stay safe and enjoy celebrating with your community, your friends, and your loved ones. Thank you. Stay safe and enjoy celebrating with your community, your friends, and your loved ones. Thank you. Thanks so much to Chris. I love that it's not just words, but also actions. For me, the actions of our employees are just as significant as those of the company. Employees here are actively making a change, like donating over $8 million since last year alone. And a big part of that amount is matched by Microsoft. What I really love about Pride is how it's driven by queer employees and allies, and how it's members of our community that is driving how we want to change internal culture. You're right, Eleanor. It's astonishing, it's astonishing to me that almost 11 out of the 12 months of the year, Microsoft employees are marching in pride parades somewhere around the world. I'm continuously blown away by the global footprint, footprint of Gleam. So why not hear from a few of the chapters? We reached out to our Gleam chapters to share what pride has no borders means to them and talk about their work. For that, I'd like to welcome Pia, Trace, and Erica to the stage. Thank you so much, Chris and Eleanor. Happy Pride Friday and welcome to Pride 2022. Today we will be showing you some of our many chapters around the world and allow them to describe what Pride Without Borders means to them. Myself, it means no matter where I end up or who I meet in my life, I can be myself without fear or judgment. This is something that didn't come naturally for me. As a prior military member, I did sometimes feel judged and felt the need to hide my true identity. As I have grown, I've built the confidence to be my authentic self never hide who I am or what I love. Pride Without Borders means we all have the ability to find and create new families from our communities who are supportive and inclusive of who we are inside. Pia? Hi everyone, I'm Pia, and this year I had the honor to meet employees across the globe, all of whom are the heart and soul of this year's Pride. Their stories have really inspired me to become a better and more active ally to this community and have made me understand what pride really means. Pride has no border really means to me. It means that all wins and setbacks anywhere affect everyone everywhere. So what we really need is unity to look over all the boundaries that separate us and not only geographical ones, but also languages, ethnicities, cultures, religions, identities, you name them, and come together to join a collective fight which won't be over until it's over for all. To you, Erica. Hi, I'm Erica. I identify as queer and Chinese American. What Pride Without Borders means to me is being able to authentically be ourselves, to embrace our identities and find connection, community, and solidarity within LGBTQ spaces. I'm excited today to see the different clean chapters around the world and how Pride is uniquely celebrated Today, we're gonna to visit over 10 different countries in four regions. Now, let's start with Gleam chapters from Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. We can't wait to see this next video. This is going to be so exciting. bedeutet Sichtbarkeit die Wertschätzung jeder einzelnen Person, da dadurch Achtsamkeit in Sprache und Begegnung stattfinden kann. Das verbindet uns alle miteinander. Mit Synlichkeit skaber wir mehr Toleranz. 
Projektilaisuuksia järjestetään ympäri maapalloa, jotta vähemmistöt saisivat enemmän näkyvyyttä. Kun vähemmistöjen näkyvyys arjessamme lisääntyy, asenteet muuttuvat ja ennakkoluulot vähenevät. Pride visibility to me it's not only a perfect way to celebrate diversity, but also an opportunity to start constructive conversations and debates with those who don't share the same values with you. At the core of Microsoft is the principle of empowerment, and that's what visibility means to me. Empowering others to be their true, authentic selves every day. Essere visibili è importante per essere se stessi pienamente, sempre. Per me è molto importante perché così riesco ad essere sempre me stesso. Het is nog steeds belangrijk zichtbaarheid hebben middels pride. Want hoe meer we aandacht geven aan het anders zijn, hoe normaler het wordt jezelf te kunnen zijn. For me, it's synlighet, retten to be the one I am. That regardless of who I am attracted to, regardless of how I identify myself, it is not just accepted, but also certainly almost daily. The sichtbarkeit of Pride shows me that I am part of a big community, and that gives me belonging. It's important to be visible to normalize our diversities, both in the work and outside, and so to help to change the society. Somos visibles por aquellas personas que no pueden serlo. För mig är synlighet att få ta med hela min personlighet, alla mina kunskaper och färdigheter in i vardagens alla situationer och tillsammans med andra unika individer skapa en helhet. Unikas är också det vi är mest att vi är mest diversifierade. Därför ser vi att vi är diversifierade på sätt som vi kan bära från tärnas. Kan sumas vara inte alla de nästa generationer sexuella. Sem limites, os planos. Sem barreiras, podemos ser nós próprios. Visibility matters to me because I want to be the role model I wish I had when I was younger. Bi erasure is when the legitimacy of bisexuality is questioned. As a bisexual person, it's important for me to stand up and let people know that I exist. Wie bunt gemischt wir sind, woher wir auch kommen, wie laut oder leise, wir sind alle einzigartig. Wir sind sichtbar. We are visible. We are unique. We are all humans. Hello Microsoft, we are the Gleam chapter from Germany. One of our diversity and inclusion mission statements is knowing me, knowing you. And our chapter members wanted to let you know what that means to them personally. Team, let's take it away. Hi, I'm Cassie, and um, as a new starter at Microsoft, it's great to have a place like Green. Especially starting in times of a pandemic, it can be really challenging. On top of that, I'm a part of an international team, so Gleam really helped me not only to um, contribute to a topic that is near and dear to my heart, but also to build connections with people that support the same cause. Hi, I'm Andreas. It is important to me to understand what day-to-day -day challenges my colleagues have to deal with. That's why I find it exciting to get to know many different characters in a colorful and diverse work environment. If I understand my opposite better, I can also emphasize better with them and deduce which issues I have to and which one I want to stand up for. Our Gleam chapter is such a diverse bunch of great people, and I get to meet them every day. Hi there, I'm Thomas. Great to be able to contribute at Gleam here in Germany together with so many cool colleagues I have. Hey, I'm Jan, a member of the Gleam community. Exchanging on common day-to-day -day challenges and understanding how others deal with them is one of the reasons why being part of the Gleam community is so important to me. Working with colleagues from multiple cultures and diverse backgrounds has helped me grow and be more of my best self every day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. During this time, this month, this is the right time for everybody to be visible. It's good to, to have a global company like Microsoft uh, being vocal and visible in the global pride parade and local pride parade, because this is allowing people that are living in different small cities to be confident, to be uh, visible without any uh, problem, without being too afraid of being who they are. So this is the reason why I think it's very important uh, to be present and uh, to be unique. What do you think? 
Yeah, thanks, Luca. I think it's uh, the theme of this year is uh, super important because, as we you know, pride has no borders, as love has no borders, because of the uh, each one of us is unique. So I'm proud, and I, I like to put this word together with pride. We, we should be proud of our pride, in a sense, because each because of our uniqueness. Yeah, I totally agree, Valerio. And uh, to me, it's uh, it's a very important and uh, unique theme as well. And to me personally, pride is no borders means that uh, there is so much more we can still achieve and there is so much more we can do together. And it's super important that we are there together as a company. Happy Pride. Nej, jag ska börja fortälla vår och vad du och vem du kan förälska dig. För det är helt normalt att du kan inte styra dig själv. Det är ingen som vill fortälla vad du ska göra och vem du kan bli förälska dig. skole så var det helt naturligt att snacka om skevhet och homofili. vi har fokus på att det är likt som alla andra och man är lika mycket värd. Eh tror att spel kan bidra på en positiv måte da, på att sätta ett lys på detta att man är kan det även om man har en anläggning. Jeg synes at læreplanen ikke har nok om dette tema, for det er såpass stort og viktig. Veldig spennende å se hvordan elevene har lært underveis, og se gleden til elevene og lærelysten i dette tema, som ja, har vært eh, givende for en lærer å eh, gjøre det på den måten. Og ikke bare sitte med en bok eller et ark som de skal lese av, men faktisk leke og spille og oppleve ting eh, på en helt annen måte. Var det gøy å spille? Ja, det ja. var veldig gøy, og det var liksom mye å gjøre sånn. Ja, det altså, var det veldig lærerikt av tid som det var gøy på en måte. At man kom i fengsel for å liksom være homofil. Det, det var litt sånn rart å høre da. Liksom, du kan jo ikke bestemme selv hva du selv føler. Og man vil jo ikke bli straffet. It's James, he, him. I'm from Microsoft UK. We have got some exciting things coming up for Pride, but here's a few others. Top of mind for us right now in the UK is supporting our trans and gender diverse community. So I'm Nancy, my pronouns are she and her. I'm the chief exec of Stonewall. And I would say that the position for LGBTQI plus people in the UK is really mixed. So lesbian, gay, bi people, a lot of our legal rights are well protected. But when we think about the position of trans people, there are some real issues with kind of access to gender affirming healthcare or being able to change their gender. And also when we think about the position of intersex people, um, there are very few kind of legal protections for intersex people in the UK. So lots of more work to do on those issues. Hi, my name is Lee Jones, uh, my pronouns are she and her and I sit on our green board here in the UK and I manage our outreach partnerships. Why are we partnering with organisations and who are we partnering with? That's the question. So we are actually partnering with three really important organisations here in the UK, Stonewall, Mermaids and Intertech. And why are we partnering with these organisations? because we here at Microsoft have a platform to really make a difference and those organisations are actively making a difference on the ground every single day, helping to support people's lives and that's why we're collaborating because we can't do it on our own and they don't have the power to do it on their own so together, hopefully, we'll be able to make that difference. I'm Hope Lawrence, pronoun she, her. You've heard about why we still have pride. It's a celebration of how much progress has been made to allow people to be who they are and to flourish in their relationships. But you've also been reminded that many challenges still exist. 
So I encourage you to join in with the celebrations. But remember, Pride is still a protest. So please use your voice to speak up and make a difference. Happy Pride. To me, Pride has no borders, means sharing the inclusive spirit I have experienced at Microsoft with my colleagues across the world. And seeing how they share their pride both internally and externally in their own communities. Many of us take a lot of things for granted and do not realize the advantage position we have in the world or how much we can influence someone else's lives that do not share the same privilege. By being a vocal ally and not a silent supporter makes a real difference. I recently became a father. I want to say to my son one day that no matter who or how he loves, it's okay and that he should love himself for it. And I also want to tell him that I have been an active participant in shaping a brighter future so that he can be himself, whatever that will mean for him. Wow. It's wow. It's so amazing to see so many different people from around the world. Visibility, uniqueness, being seen and accepted. All of those things are so close to many of us. I was really touched by the teaching and learning of the students in Norway. We briefly touched on some of our European chapters today. Our presence in the region is vast. There are many chapters across the Middle East and Africa too. And I want to say thank you to all of our colleagues there doing amazing work and pushing LGBTQIA plus equity forward. We are all in this together and we can truly make a difference. Look at what our next regions have to say, Latin America. Hello, my name is Alan Torres, pronounced he, him, and I am the regional director of GLEAM in Latin America. I have the honor of working with nine different chapters across the region, and I've had the privilege of getting to work and meet the most amazing people. What inspires me the most from all this community is the amazing resilience and the amount of people that is getting involved, and not just the LGBTQI plus community, but also our allies. And we have been able to develop talking points beyond our sexual orientation and gender identity, like talking about our families, our mental health, sustainability. Hi, I am Bea. I'm a Hispanic woman. I am the International Affairs Lead for CLEAM ERG Chapter from Costa Rica and Central Sub. The biggest thing my chapter has made this year is out of five of the ERG GLEAM Awards, four of them fell into our chapter in, Centro, in Costa Rica and Central Sub. That's amazing. I am super proud to be part of this amazing team where I am able to learn more and more about what we can do in each of our positions in each of our countries to help the LGBTQIA plus community have their voices heard. Thank you. Pride has no borders because everyone is different. Everyone has their own identity. But at the end, we are in this together and we can create safe spaces for others. And if you have the opportunity to create those safe places, you must do it. And this is why we are trying to create opportunities and places for people in Latam and Costa Rica to be who you are and embrace what you are. Thank you. Como recientemente manifestamos públicamente junto a muchas otras empresas en respaldo a la ley de matrimonio igualitario, ya que es fundamental que se fomenten espacios donde se visibilice y concientice para ir derribando prejuicios que generalmente nacen del desconocimiento. Abrir la conversación para que la empatía y el respeto prevalezcan. 
happy pride from our chapter in Glen, Mexico. To give a little context of what is going on in our country, in 27 states, it is now prohibited conversion therapies. In 23 states, we can now request a change of our birth certificate to the gender that we identified with. And same-sex marriage is now legal in 26 states. We have also seen many more number of spaces for discussions and awareness of this subject. In Guadalajara, this week, we were able to march for our rights and celebration of pride alongside 21,500 individuals. We look forward as a chapter in June 25th to march alongside in Mexico City. But there's still too much to be done as we're in the second number, second place in Latin America for hate crimes and homophobia. And in 2021, we are the second number of murders, a great number of murders of trans and people, uh, gender diverse people. That is why in Glean, Mexico, we'll focus on the visibility of the trans community and we focus on the communities that require greater awareness. We have had events such as March 31st, Trans Visibility Day, to give a day in the life of a trans woman in Mexico. We had a co-host event, three sessions, called Unconditional, in which we talk about the experience of individuals, family members, and the learnings that we had during this event. On Idahoad, we had a whole week to create awareness. And Mexico was able to share in a panel with non-binary and trans individuals to get their experiences as well. Looking forward, we want to grow our community with inclusive hiring. We also want Mexico, especially a chapter in Mexico, to feel like a safe space for our clients, for our colleagues and our peers, and set an example for an inclusive workplace in Mexico. Thank you and happy Pride. Colombia has unliberal policies like same-sex marriage, same-sex adoption, even entry into the armed force are openly allowed. However, despite the fact that the country has anti-discrimination laws, LGBT people face discrimination. Trans people are the most vulnerable. They are still facing violence and discrimination. Being Colombia, one of the countries that report the most hate, hate crimes against trans people in Latin America, along with Mexico and Honduras. In our chapter in Colombia, we consolidated a team of 10 people, established a quarterly event to educate our subsidiary, and for the first time, we celebrated Pride as a big event. We built an alliance with Casa Refugio, that is an ONG that offers housing, food, legal and psychological advice for LGBTQI plus community that are victim of violence. Well, our next goal is to have a joint venture with an ONG that helps trans community to find jobs. Also, we want to help this trans community through our GLIM Technical Academy to empower them in technical skills. Hi. Pride has no border means to us. No matter where you are, you are not alone. We must face our issues together. Amazing. As a Latino myself, it really fills me with joy to see all of these employees and chapters from across the region celebrating Pride. I admire how they've thought through key initiatives to focus on, like education and inclusive hiring. Definitely a win for some is a win for all in Latin America and beyond. So with that, let's play our next video, which will show how the Indian chapter celebrated Pride. Can't wait for you to watch it. a momentous day for Microsoft and India Development Center. This is the first time we are hoisting the pride flag with a lot of pride in our heart. The pride has no borders, no borders in terms of geographies, language, culture, race and ethnicity. Today's occasion also marks the culmination of years of effort from a lot of people out here who have really kind of fought through it 
with all their grit to bring us where we are today. Hey everyone, this is Harsha Roy Kumar and my pronouns are he and him and I co-lead the Gleam India ERG. And I'm super excited for this Pride Month uh, this year. It's been an amazing journey for us for the last couple of years since the launch of the ERG and we've done so many for the first times in our country this time. Um, we've launched uh, an amazing, great campaign. Uh, we started with a flag hoisting for the very first time uh, in this country, uh, in any of the Microsoft uh, offices. And then uh, we put up a huge banner uh, talking about how LGBTQI plus inclusion means important for us. And, uh, and then we put up a beautiful uh, LED uh, projection uh, of rainbow colors on the building uh, here in uh, Hyderabad campus. And then we are also organizing for the very first time a pride walk within the campus. And uh, we saw amazing uh, support from all the allies um, in the company that day. And it was super amazing uh, to see so many happy faces uh, walking uh, and celebrating uh, the LGBTQ plus community during the month of Pride. And uh, in terms of our journey um, uh, legally, right, in this country is uh, pretty interesting. We did uh, decriminalize homosexuality or LGBTQ plus community uh, in the country by removing Section 377 uh, in the year 2018. But uh, we have a long, long way to go. Uh, as an ERG, what I'm super proud of is a conversational series we started this year called Raising Reasons, um, where we just hosted raw, authentic conversations about LGBTQ plus community, understanding and unpeeling some of the important aspects about the community and their experiences. Uh, what, invite, what that invited is a huge support from the ERG and, and the larger employees at Microsoft here. Um, the conversations were, were really well received and people were left with a lot of learnings uh, towards the end of the conversation. That's really huge for us. And of course, uh, we were uh, given the gold category of the Workplace Equality Index here in India for consecutive uh, third year. And I'm super, super uh, happy to share that fact. India chapters during the culmination of so much hard work and effort to lead with visibility, allyship, so and community. Hard. There's many more active chapters in Asia that we didn't hear from today, but we are still so grateful for your work. Thank you. How do y'all like the world? Now let's move on to the next region, North America, and check out a couple more colleagues who are leading the community to there. To, to tree. I needed it to be colorful. I'm Alice Stala, and I'm honored to welcome you to Microsoft Pride 2022, an annual event where we come together to drive for change, equity, and inclusion around the world. While we celebrate in June, supporting and lifting one another up is a year-round commitment. As I reflect on growing up in rural Louisiana, in a predominantly black community, there were so many freedoms denied to us, including the ability to be your authentic self and to simply love who you wanted to love. Today, I am proud to be a part of the Microsoft family where we encourage dialogue, we take action, we stand up for freedom and justice. In the world we live in, our communities are interconnected and we can only solve our challenges if we come together as one beyond borders and boundaries. I look forward to celebrating with you and learning how to be a better ally and advocate. I want to welcome everyone to Pride. I'm excited for this month, which is full of opportunities to connect, 
celebrate and drive progress together. As a leader and an aspiring ally, one of my top priorities is to create a culture where everyone feels valued, where we all feel we belong, and where we're all empowered and encouraged to show up, be ourselves, and to speak openly. I believe we make the most progress when we center the voices of members from underrepresented groups, especially those who live at the intersection of multiple systems of oppression. So for me, Pride is all about lifting up and tuning in to the voices of members of the Gleam community. I'm especially excited to celebrate and to learn more about the diversity within the community, knowing there are many among us who are LGBTQIA plus people of color, who are members of religious minorities, and those who may never have been able to define their lived experiences in terms of a single identity. I see you, I stand with you, and I'm honored to be here with you. Hello, my name is Bethany Amy. My pronouns are she and her. I am a lead for our Southeast U.S. Gleam chapter, and I'm really excited about reinvigorating and re-energizing our chapter this year. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the South U.S. Uh, that have been difficult this year, and uh, we will continue to discuss and have challenging conversations, but I'm looking forward to getting people together and sharing things that we are loving and passionate about. It's so nice to see that there are members of the community all around the world and to see them take action. So now, even though we have only heard from a few of them, we have active Gleam chapters in over 60 countries. And our individual effort and voice combined makes a huge difference. That's one of the most exciting things about working here. And I'm always learning something new through the perspectives of others. We're truly at our best when our tables are diverse. So, transitioning into our next segment, we're going to talk about representation and inclusion in gaming. And in my experience, having diverse people work on such culture impacting products like games make them more inclusive. So I'm actually really excited to hear about what the team at Xbox LGBTQIA plus is doing over at Xbox. Hello, so excited to be here Love with your you. awesome virtual avatars. Uh, my name is Matt. My pronouns are he and him. I'm an executive producer who works at uh, Xbox Game Studios. Tifa? Hi, I'm Tifa Robles. I work on the Game Pass team as a digital marketing manager, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I've worked with Matt on Team Xbox LGBTQA for the last three years. Yeah, and it's uh, been... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, my, my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> yeah, and it's been a ton of fun. We've been having an awesome time um, with uh, what we get to do, with the privilege that we get to have. Um, for me, you know, Pride is about this chance for our community to be able to take the stage, to sort of seize the chance to, to be heard, to be seen, and to have a real impact on, you know, the issues that cause harm to all of us around the globe. Um, so for today, we just really wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you know, any of you out there who are making something, if you are writing a book, if you're drawing a comic, if you're painting a mural, if you're coding a video game, if you're composing a song, whatever you're doing, we just want to say it is so important that you're doing it. Um, when the people in our community, you know, create things, and especially when you make something that shares our stories, that shares the lived experiences in all, you know, its vibrance and its diversity, it really matters. Yeah, when we share our stories, I think it helps people to know that they aren't alone. It creates a chance for people in our community to be seen, to feel like they're understood, and maybe even to understand themselves a little better. And for those who don't understand us yet, it's a chance to help bridge those gaps and give them the new perspective, a new perspective of the human experience, to give them a chance to understand our struggles and hopefully become a part of the solution. Inside Xbox, around the world, working on our games, our devices, and our services. There are hundreds of people who are a part of our community. And we've brought stories from those, some of those folks about the times they've felt seen in games, in the games that they play, and how games have impacted their lives. So before we talk about their stories, I just kind of want to share a personal story of representation for me. Um, you know, when I was early in the games industry starting out, there was this little indie movie coming out called uh, Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. It was, uh, you know, just a little, a little thing, a little sci-fi uh, film. But 
uh, there was a game that was kind of around at the same time with all the different, you know, prequels. And the game was Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, uh, created by a studio called BioWare. And that game had in it the first representation of any sort of LGBTQIA plus person in um, in uh, a Star Wars franchise or a Star Wars property with this um really powerful, awesome character named Juhani, who was like part of your party and could come and, and be just this really bad lesbian that you could hang out with and um, even, you know, uh, just build like a really good relationship with. And when I had that experience of seeing that character and seeing that representation in games, it really opened my eyes to the power that I would get to have at beginning to work in this industry by getting to create games to create things that people fall in love with, um, to, you know, be able to show somebody a little bit different, show somebody that uh, people weren't possible before. And games have always been able to be sort of on the cutting edge of that. And I'm just excited to be a very small part of that. And I hope to get, keep doing it going forward. Tifa, do you have any good stories about representation or about a time where, you know, that had an impact on you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I've, I've played games my whole life, but I remember when I played Stardew Valley uh, for the first time, it helped me feel comfortable both building romantic relationships with women, which at that point in my life, I had not had the chance to do. Uh, and it also helped me work through and accepting my own polyamorous identity. Um, in the game, I married uh, a woman who didn't care that I flirted with all the villagers and I ended up getting to 10 hearts with everyone. Uh, and it was really great to get to explore that in a safe way in a virtual you know world with uh characters that i could fall in love with but still not not worry about hurting <laughs> um and just being able to, to play through experiences and discover myself in that way has been really powerful even with newer games like boyfriend dungeon and unpacking which are recent titles um that have representation in very innovative ways uh so yeah that's i feel like games continue to help me figure out who I am through my whole life. So today, what we wanted to do is we've been talking to tons and tons of people who are part of, you know, Team Xbox, LGBTQIA+, our, our community within Team Xbox of people who are, you know, part of this community. And we wanted to share some of their stories that they told us with you today, some of the things for the folks who couldn't be here on stage with us to kind of share the types of things that representation and the way it impacts the people who make some of the games, some of the services, some of the products and devices um, that you all love to, to play. So this first story comes from an artist uh, from one of our most popular Xbox games we develop here at Xbox Game Studios. I'm not going to name any names, um, but you might be able to guess. Um, the story is as follows. Uh, you don't see stories about ace people in movies or in video games. And when you do, they're not usually shown in a positive way. And you especially never see love stories about ace people because everybody assumes just because you're ace, you're not interested in romance. Recently, I was playing The Outer Worlds, which is a role-playing game made by Obsidian Entertainment. And I ran into a conversation with a character named Parvati, who was not just ace, but was like a really warm and caring person. And they were looking for romantic advice from my character. I literally cried and had to take a minute before I kept playing. Because for the first time in a really long time, I felt like somebody out there understood that being ace doesn't mean that you don't have feelings. That's a really, yeah, that's a really powerful moment. Uh, and I am really happy that lots of the different identities that we hear about, including ones that we don't hear about as much are showing up in games. Um, this next story uh, comes from my Xbox product designer. I love open world RPG games and have played a shameful amount of Skyrim. I was delighted when my, I realized my male character could marry another handsome male character at the Shrine of Mara with the exchange of really beautiful vows. I do agree to be bound in this love now and forever. I continue to be even more delighted when I hear his loving words Hello, dear. Back from another exciting adventure again. Whenever I return to our home from battling with Daedra and the dragons, we even were able to adopt two children as well. Thank you, Skyrim, for making things so simple feel so normal. This next story uh, comes from an engineer who works in game testing here at Xbox. 
Playing the Mass Effect series really opened my eyes to things I was either too afraid to speak aloud or hadn't even thought about until it was presented to me. I had never even thought about non-heterosexual relationships in the gaming space, let alone interspecies dynamics. And I was forced to contend with multiple tiers of cultural difference in an explorative sci-fi space where the characters not only didn't judge you for asking questions, but encouraged it. Let's just say I thought I was totally straight before playing the game, and that has since changed. Next powerful story is from a user experience designer. Wander song, you play as the bard, who is referred to with they, them pronouns like it's no big deal. are also optimistic and want to save the world without resorting to violence, even when it seems like that's the only way. I relate to them so much. Wander song also has many other queer characters presented as totally unexceptional, which makes the world feel cozy and familiar. How often does media normalize having a lot of queer friends and acquaintances? I know, because it's so interesting, right? That like our lived experiences, we have so many amazing people in our community. I have so many close friends who are, you know, all, all different walks of life, all different things. And in games, you always end up having, you know, in movies and TV shows and things, it's always like, oh, that's that's the gay character. Oh, that's the bi character. Oh, that's the trans character. And Wonder Song is so cool for being able to like make it just a part of the living tapestry of the world. I, I that was also one that was you know personally speaking was really powerful for me too. Um, this next story actually comes from a program manager who's a part of Team Xbox. When I played Dragon Age Origins and was able to romance another man, it was like a weight was lifted that I didn't even know I was carrying made me realize the constant mental work I was doing of translating male-female stories to fit my life. Within that game, it was just there, and it felt amazing. This next story comes from a game producer. Bull is a game where your character can impress and attract and romance not just people of the opposite sex, but people of the same sex, too. Beyond that, in the game, you could go from place to place and have multiple different relationships. And Fable let me explore my attraction to multiple genders in a safe space at my own pace. And it was huge for me to understand who I was. And I'm so thankful. That one, actually, I relate to that one as well, because I loved playing the Fable games. Uh, and I also liked the freedom of expression within that game um, and finding your own path, including with romance. So this last story, it comes from somebody who works in user research uh, here at Xbox. I have to warn you, this story is a little bit heavy, and um, there are some uh, you know, themes around self-harm, just so I wanted to give folks a little warning about that. When I first played Gone Home, it hit me so hard. I'd lost someone I cared about to suicide, and playing Gone Home with its unapologetic and raw queer themes made me feel closer to the person I'd lost in their absence. And in the end, it actually helped me process the trauma and the grief I was going through in a way that I don't think I would have been able to without it. Stories like that are always so you know hard to hear, but we actually got way more than just that one story with similar themes. I think people in our community know uh, the struggle and know how we deal with loss and the kind of trauma that it can bring. And games have been a really powerful way for people in our community to safely experience and interact with that trauma to unpack some of their feelings, not just in the game unpacking, but in other games as well. And mm -hmm. it's um, it's been something that I think is is so important and so powerful. So, yeah, and, honestly, oh, please, yeah. <laughs> and there are millions of stories like this out there uh, and hunt, and more and more games uh, that are coming out with these themes as well, uh, where someone took the time to pour their own stories and experiences onto the screen and in doing so, changing the course of people's lives for the better. You know, one thing that we're really starting to understand here uh, as part of our community and we're really talking about with each other all the time is the fact that like when we tell people our stories, when we tell people what is true about us and when you share something, when you're out there making something amazing and you're sharing something about who you are and how uh, you know meaningful it is 
your lived experiences, the things that you've gone through. It can help give other people the courage to, you know, be able to be themselves. It can help them feel safe. It can help them feel understood. Uh, it can even give people, like some of the stories we talked about, a discovery, you know, the opportunity to discover who they really, really are. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, all of you, for listening, uh, for hearing our stories today, and for uh, being willing to come on this journey with us. Um, again, we got way too many stories that we could uh, begin to share, so we were only able to share a handful today, but I'm really uh, glad that we were able to tell them. I would like to say, in addition to thank you, uh, that being a part of Team Xbox LGBTQIA has helped me find community at work uh, who understands the intricacies of being queer, and I feel fully accepted at the workplace. I know that I'm not alone, and being able to talk about my personal life safely adds a sense of fulfillment and belonging. So for all of you out there, please keep telling our stories. There are stories that only you can tell and you never know whose life they may change forever. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Matt and Tifa. That was honestly amazing. I loved hearing all the stories you had to say. Yes, it was so incredible to hear. And, you know, just growing up, I remember, well, I don't remember having any LGBTQIA plus representation in video games. So, you know, it's incredible the work the Xbox team, Xbox team is doing, making these virtual worlds reflect our own. I can't wait to see what's in store next. So uh, speaking about representation, we're about to move on to our next segment. And so that brings us to the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Intersex Association, ILGA World, Outright Action International, and LGBTQIA plus leaders across Microsoft to talk about the state of the queer world today. So we, so we would like to give a warm welcome to the stage, Kanyo, Gurchatan, Rashmi, Alan, and George. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this outtakes episode. My name is Danielle Solomon and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I will be the moderator for our panel today. I currently serve as the Director for Justice Reform and Racial Equity Policy as part of the Microsoft U.S. Government Affairs Team. For those of you who may not be looking at the screen or are visually impaired, let me provide a visual description of myself. I'm an African-American woman with a red dress on. I have long brown hair and I added some red glasses for fun today. So let me tell you a little bit about Out at MCB. Out at MCB is an employee resource group for LGBTQIA plus employees within marketing and consumer business. This year's Pride theme is Pride Has No Borders, which speaks to the intersectional and international experiences of queerness. Our event today is entitled Still Rising, A State of a Queer World. This is the fourth year of the Still Rising panel. Each year we bring together a group of leaders and change makers to unpack queerness and the themes that speak most to the moment of time. This year, our conversation will broadly focus on queerness in 2022, intersectionality beyond nationality and equity across the globe for queer people. Today, we have an amazing group of people joining us. But before we come together for our panel discussion, we've asked each of them to give a brief overview of their work and experience individually. With that, let me start with Rashmi. Hello. Uh, my name is Rashi Panda. My pronouns are he, her, hers. Um, I currently serve as the support business group lead for Microsoft India. And I'm also the Glean ERG group lead for India. Um, I have brown hair and eyes. I wear glasses. And I'm wearing a big jacket, brown shirt, and jeans now. Kanyo. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kanyo and uh, my pronouns are she, her. 
I am medium height and I have beautiful brown skin. I am based in a very bitterly cold Johannesburg tonight. Um, I am the Africa Advocacy Officer at Outright Action International, and I'm really delighted to be here today. Thank you. Great, Alan. Hello, everyone. This is Alan Torres. I am currently in Costa Rica, and I'm part of the digital sales organization within Microsoft. I'm also the original director of the Glean community in Latin America, and I am a Latino man with black eyes, very sh small beard, and I'm wearing a purple shirt um, in this amazing space. So nice to see all of you. Thank you. Gurchatin. George? Hi, my name is George. Um, I go with uh, he, him. Um, today I'm wearing a green t-shirt and purple pants. At Microsoft, my day job is to lead events and digital marketing for Central and Eastern Europe. And I also serve as the global LGBTQI plus CRG as a policy co-director. I'm originally from Kazakhstan and I live and work in Czech Republic. Thank you. And Gurchatin, did you want to go ahead? Okay, we might be having some technical difficulties. Let me just keep going. So thank you, panelists. Um, I'm excited to start this conversation. So let's begin with some fun lightning round questions. I'm gonna ask each of you um, a set of questions. They're supposed to be fun and fast. Um, so let's get this started. Um, what is the last thing that you did that made you smile? Everybody jump in. I made a wish on a rainbow uh, when it rained today, and there was a beautiful rainbow. Made a wish. I'm not telling you what it was, but that, that, that's what it made Anybody else? I went for a walk with my beautiful dog, Willow, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, it was beautiful, and although it was bitterly cold, it was, it was made me smile. It's great. Anybody else want to jump in or should I go to the next one? Today I went out to my greenhouse uh, and saw the most beautiful Saracenia flower in bloom. American pitchy plants are just magical. <laughs> it made me smile a lot. Anything outside is so great, right? I, I hear a lot of that um, and the answers. Anybody else? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think uh, we are the same way with Alan. Uh, I did a very simple thing. I went to the farmer's market today and I just bought flowers for my home. And that kind of was so little and exciting. Wonderful. Okay, next question. Who was your greatest inspiration growing up? Uh, for me, it was my grandmother. Because some of the decisions were like way ahead of the time, and I'm especially in the context of uh, India, an Indian joint family setup. Some of those were extremely radical and path breaking. So she's an inspiration in many, many ways. Um, I'll go next because my my inspiration is also my grandmother. Um, she was a um, first-generation graduate, but even then she was not allowed to work um, despite having her qualification. And so she, uh, you know, through a lot of tenacity and not giving up and a lot of sacrifice, she eventually was able to work. But after many years of, of, of oppression and not being allowed to actually practice her job that she started to do. Well, I think that um, one of the things I loved or, or one of the people I looked up a lot was Frida Kahlo, who was a bisexual Mexican artist. She celebrated her brown, hairy skin, and she was always breaking traditional gender roles. She went through many things in life, positive and not so positive, but she always kept trying and thriving. That really inspires me to thrive for self-love and look for resilience always. I'll play a nerdy one here. At school, my biggest inspiration was my mathematics teacher. 
and she actually gave me a lot, not only as a professional, but also the human being, an ideal thought that she gave to me back then. Thank you, everybody. Let's do one last one, and this one's a fun one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? It's going on the wrong track, but just hope the superpower and take it to be a little more kind. I think for me, I would want to be able to teleport or time travel. I'm really fascinated about different cultures and contexts. And I really wish I could be able to just be there and, you know, at different times and observe and learn from um, the different cultures and geographies. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, I would love to have infinite knowledge and know everything in terms of uh, historical facts, data, um, anything around the world, um, especially to correct people and, you know, um, be done with uh, misinformation and uh, negative and uh, negative truths around the world. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll do next. Oh. Uh, okay. So I would it's also go ahead. Go. <laughs> you go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So for me, it's also a time travel. And I know that the writers normally say that it's not allowed. You cannot change the past. But I would really try to do, to improve some things uh, in the human history to make uh, this world a better place. Personally, would love to have a super memory. Imagine being able to learn and never forget everything. I ever saw or ever heard. I mean, it sounds like endless possibilities. Those are all great. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing some of those uh, answers to the lightning round. Well, now that we've all been better acquainted with each other, let's move on to some more structured questions for the event. As you all know, this year's Pride theme is Pride Has No Borders. Given your background and experience in global queer activism, what does this mean to you? George, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think today the biggest context for my region is war in Ukraine. LGBTQI community is one of the most impacted groups here. And this war has a severe impact on queer community. I was born in Kazakhstan, back then part of Soviet Union. I was growing in the environment where being gay is not the best idea. My friends in Kazakhstan, in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Russia, we all experience discrimination. We are covering. The of us are not out yet because society doesn't really accept it. Well, many countries in this part of the world, in my region, have made some progress towards equality. This war might bring us back. I'm truly inspired by LGBTQI activists in Ukraine who are defending their country and freedom. And it's super important as never before to be united and support Ukraine. Thank you, George. Gurchatin, do you would you like to jump in? Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, I never caught the quite full question. Sorry. Sure. Given your background and experience in global queer activism, what does this year's Pride theme mean to you? Pride has no borders. What does that mean to you? Um, I think right now, with so many uh, crises, like the one just mentioned in Ukraine, there's other crises now sort of being triggered. Um, we had the food insecurity crisis. We have an infl uh, inflation or financial crisis. Um, and I think it's really important that we come together in terms of solidarity. Um, I don't think there's borders, not just physical um, in terms of territory, but also in terms of thought. Uh, borders in terms of um, freedoms, uh, borders in terms of um, identities um, between our communities as well, um, which are not uh, physical, but they are there. Uh, those borders that exist between, um, you know, 
between uh, um, our colleagues who are uh, our, uh, members of a community who are gender diverse and trans. Um, and so I think there you have um, those, those, those themes, that solidarity is so essential now that we can see past those borders and really come together as movement because there are, there are uh, without sounding alarmist, there are, there are, there are cracks, if not um, um, kinks in our community, which are great, could break us in terms of race, in terms of um, supporting trans people, um, which are th which could potentially be a threat. So this year, this theme is so important because it calls for unity. It calls for us to come together um, beyond those borders, beyond those physical ones as well. I think that's really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, I want to bring you into this conversation. How about you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, um, here's the thing. When we started working in, uh, when I personally started working in, uh, in Gleam in LATAM, we were thriving to look for ways to celebrate our people beyond our gender diversity and sexual orientation. Why do we think of that way? Because when we try to focus a little bit in, into what is LGBT, what is uh, being trans, those are very important topics, but our leadership team and our diversity and inclusion leaders are doing a tremendous job with those conversations. So that's when we started to focus in things beyond that. And that's when we started to focus in uh, conversations around mental health. Let's talk about sustainability. Let's talk about um, uh, human rights. Let's talk about inclusive communication. And those conversations actually led me to learn what I think Pride Has No Borders means for me today. And that's actually thanks to a conversation I had with our global Pride lead, Aisha, um, from Gleam Worldwide, where pretty much what we're trying to say is that Pride Has No More Borders means that instead of trying to label or identify the things that makes us different, such as my sexual orientation or my gender identity, we need to find those things that unite us through our intersectionality. In other words, it is very easy to see what makes us different. So let's instead find out what we have in common and celebrate that. Thank you. Thank you, I love that, Alan. Um, Kanyo, let's go with you. Next up, your Thanks thoughts. so much. Um, yeah, I thought this this theme was such Let's a powerful um, theme to have um, around this oh, this right. year's Pride. Uh, so Pride really unifies LGBT communities all over the world. But what what it actually means for different communities has evolved over the years. Um, Pride can be um, in, in our different countries, especially here in Africa, pride has been used to raise awareness, for example, about certain challenges and, and violations that uh, LGBT persons face. Uh, it has also been used uh, as a protest. It has been used as a, as a way to, to do advocacy. Uh, it's also been used as a way to build alliances and build communities. Pride has even been used as a resistance, a form of resistance in many countries in this continent. Um, so pride has had a purpose and remains uh, an event that has a huge purpose for many of our countries on the continent, some of which have not or yet to even have pride celebrations, or yet to even have the opportunity to, to celebrate um, pride. So uh, for me, pride has no borders, uh, means that um, our struggle um, is everybody else's struggle. Uh, my struggle is your struggle. Uh, no matter where I am in the world, um, Everybody who celebrates Pride also recognizes my struggle for freedom of expression, my struggle for freedom to, to be alive, my struggle to, to, to be free from violence. Um, and as we in, in, in Africa, uh, some countries have only had their first Pride from last year only, and some will yet to have it. Um, those who are able to celebrate everywhere in the world uh, are carrying us on their shoulders, uh, are, are also pushing our struggle forward in some way um, at, through their activities. So that what that's what that means to me. 
Thank you. And Rashmi, how about you? What do you think a pride has no borders means? What does it mean to you? Hi, everyone. I'm going to be sharing a few words that Rashmi um, wrote up for this. With the increase in challenges being faced by the LGBTQIA plus community, it is not just physical borders, which are a worry in Rashmi's perspective, but those in the minds of people, especially those who influence the lives of others. From an Indian perspective, there is a border between community members in bigger cities and those living in small towns and villages where the challenges and pressures are so, so different. So pride has no borders means bringing all of those people together. Thank you. Okay. The queer community has been targeted for a long time. And even just recently, there have been so many challenges that we're all facing, namely restricting health care for trans youth, the don't say gay bill, your books being banned, and even violence. But that is just in the United States. What does advocacy look like in your respective parts of the world? And what are issues and challenges against your activism that may not be talked about more commonly? George, I'm going to go back to you. Thank you. Um, I think that there is a big difference in the challenges different countries are actually experiencing. There are many factors such as religion, politics, history. As I mentioned, I was born in Kazakhstan. Today I live in Czech Republic. And I can compare what is the gay agenda here versus what is being discussed in Western Europe or in America, for example. I believe that in many countries in my region, as well as in other parts of the world, in Asia, Middle East, Africa, or Latin America, we need to fix sometimes basics. For example, this week I had a the private store. George, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Let, let's check your audio and, and come back to you so you can finish up. But in the meantime, let me go over to um, Gurchatin. Can you hear me now? Oh, can you hear me? I think yes. you may need to uh, make me a little bit louder. Um, sorry, could you, um, I missed the end of that question again, sorry. Sure, no problem. So let me start, let me read it again. Um, based, the question is around the fact that there are a lot of challenges that we're facing in the United States. But what does advocacy look like in your respective parts of the world? And what are issues and challenges against your activism that may not be talked about more commonly? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you could uh, amplify me, that would be great. Um, where do I start? I mean, we work on the global level. Um, and uh, we do global advocacy, especially in the UN space. And this year is one of the most important years ever. In 2016, thanks to ILGA and ILGA World's uh, coordination and, and leadership, as, along with civil society organizations, we were effectively able to advocate for, the, uh, for a, an independent expert on sexual orientation, uh, on, on, uh, on violence and discrimination, uh, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression. And every three years, this mandate has to be renewed. So we've now come to uh, a re year of in which that mandate needs to be re renewed. So it was renewed in 2019. Three years later, um, it needs to be renewed again. Now, for those who may not know, um, this mandate or the renewal of this mandate happens in the UN or in the UN uh, Human Rights Council. So, for example, the UN Human Rights Council is where, where you have special rapporteurs, a special rapporteur uh, for um, freedom of expression, a special rapporteur on freedom of belief, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where the mandate is also voted. So, you know, this year we have a critical time where, you know, it really depends on how member states vote and 
it's going to be very, very tricky and decisive um, whether we're going to actually secure a, a mandate. Now, if we don't get this, this will push back the LGBTI, if we don't secure this mandate or the votes that need to ensure uh, to get enough votes to get this uh, get this through the, the finishing line, this could push back the LGBTI movement globally 15, if not 20 to 25 years. Um, it will undo a lot of the progress that we have made because what we have effectively been able to do is elevate and amplify the voices or those invisibilized voices to the global level. So I think for us, it's a very, very important year. And not many people know this because, you know, they think about the UN and they think how far and distant it is. But that very organization that has been set up by governments around the world that come together to negotiate very, very important decisions in, can impact our lives directly, whether we like to believe it or not. So this, um, the independent expert this year has issued, um, has conducted, will be conducting, for example, a very important visit to the USA, um, has just relaunched his uh, report on health and the impacts of uh, violence and discrimination against uh, LGBTI or but on the grounds of SOGI um, um, on LGBTIQ plus people. So at that level is very, very important. And then we have other issues when it comes to um, um, mainstreaming or advocating for LGBTI rights into UN spaces, um, and not just into the human rights mechanism, but also the development agenda as well. Uh, quite concerningly, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for those who know uh, the World Health Organization has an annual meeting called the World Health Assembly. Here, key language was being discussed around um, HIV, STIs, and hepatitis. And there was a specific footnote which said that sexual orientation was not an agreed upon language in the UN system. Now, had that been voted through, again, it would have pushed our movement back and given member states and governments and uh, hostile governments the right to um, push back on much of the progress and use it. And it would have haunted us for years to come. And I think one of the key things for us is, you know, we've now got the SDG agenda, SDG 2030, where we're talking about leaving no one behind. Now, if we're really going to leave no one behind, that really has to include LGBTIQ plus people. So we're working closely um, with our partners here at the table today, Outright International with RFSL in Sweden, to make sure that SDGs do include LGBTIQ plus people globally and their voices and they are counted for in, and um, included in those discussions at the global level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alan, how about you? Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, well, in Latin America, it is very easy to see a lot of um, a lot of imagery that shows that we are very LGBTQI plus friendly, and we're very lucky to have out of the 33, I think 33, 34 countries that we have in LATAM and the Caribbean territories, we're very lucky to have seven countries that already approved the equal marriage between same-sex couples. Yet there are still nine countries where it is actually cr a criminal punishment for being gender or sexually diverse. And um, we also see that there is a lot of forced and coercive medical in interventions on intersex people. We, we recently heard a story in one of our events at Lim in, in, in Latam where a person said that they were actually uh, induced into a medical procedure without even telling their parents and uh, by the time this person became an adult, they were able to, through some medical interventions and studies, were was able to identify their own intersex identity. So these type of human rights violations combined with so many countless unsolved hate crimes, endemic and exclusive discrimination, negligence and justice, uh, uh, injustice, I mean, it, I, I could add so much more, but there's one uh, fact or data that is very worrying, and it is for our trans community in Latin America, where the life expectancy of a trans person, it's only 35 years old. 
talking 35. I'm 34. I'm 34. It means that if I were a trans person, it would I would only have at least one more year um, if because of suicidal thoughts, because of um, the different things that our community endures in, in the region. Yes, there's all of that, absolutely. And we cannot avoid the conversation on all the harm and all the hatred that our community goes through. But we can also celebrate the great things that are, is happening at a, at, a, at a corporate and government levels. For example, in Costa Rica recently, we were able to celebrate um, a couple of years ago the same-sex marriage. Chile this year actually is celebrating their first um, uh, marriage equality year. And actually, I, I would love to give a shout out to our Microsoft uh, Chile team. The, the president of Microsoft in uh, Chile said that the time for marriage equality has come in our country. I think we should delve into the value of freedom, including the freedom to love and form a family with a loved one. Within the framework of Microsoft's inclusion and diversity policies, Microsoft was the first company to publicly support the passing of the Equal Marriage Law in Chile. And within 48 hours of announcing support, it they also mobilized more than 30 organizations and companies, both international and Chilean, to join this initiative. We're seeing people um, get some rights. We're seeing our LGBTQI plus community receive some of our basic human rights across the region. But until we have all the equal rights for everyone, it won't be um, it, it, it won't be applying to all. So yes, I would love to pretty much live with a note that um, I'm very proud to be part of a company that doesn't only work in these initiatives on June, but we are also driving these conversations all year long in an effort to try to make sure that everyone here feels like their best selves, their best authentic selves, and that we are able to promote um, that uh, people just just be yourself, be your um, and bring your best uh, to work in design and, and serve our customers across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for reminding us to celebrate the wins, even when we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. That's what keeps us going. Um, Kunyu, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you're dealing with? Thank you. Uh, so in our uh, Africa program, we've been uh, trying to really unearth some data and information on, on the nature, the extent and the impact of conversion practices. Uh, and these are basically practices uh, that are geared at uh, changing people's sexual orientation. And um, uh, this information, unfortunately, is so scarce uh, at the moment. There, it hasn't been researched enough. There is a gap in really understanding what do these practices look like? Who are the perpetrators of these per um, practices? Who's at risk of them? Uh, you know, what shape do they take? Do they go on at the same time? Or uh, is it a combination, et cetera? Um, I recently watched, for example, the uh, a, a documentary called Cured, which tells the story uh, of, of the American journey of conversion practices. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, we just um, we haven't had enough data on what these look like. So we've had a project where we've worked with local partners in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, where um, the organizations on the ground have led the research, um, because also when this research has existed, it has been research done by others and not by us for us. So um, this is research that is done by local um, LGBTQ organizations who really understand the nuances and dynamics, especially when it comes to areas of tradition and religion um, and even some medical healthcare spaces where these practices are being done. So uh, this research has been ongoing and uh, since 2019 and with um, the, the, the the partners have produced really, really powerful um, and impactful information of 
what these look like. Um, and so we now know which spaces they happen, who are the perpetrators, the forms of these practices that include, for example, coercion, um, so-called corrective rape, torture, beatings, and all these kind of, of, of very violent uh, types of efforts which are done in order to try and change people's sexual orientation. But then at the same time, there are also efforts which not necessarily include uh, har um, force um, and coercion, but at the same time are also very, very uh, harmful themselves. So this this, this uh, very important data is, is helpful in now strategizing how do we eradicate these practices all over the continent. And unfortunately, these are just the three countries we've researched. They're still so many other places in the continent, this has not been researched. And even the preliminary data we found shows that so many young people are at high risk of experiencing these harmful practices. But of course, as we know in Africa, uh, a very large majority, close to 70% of the population is young people who remain at risk of these harmful practices. And what makes it even more difficult is that the spaces uh, where we hope to advance these conversations and call on policy makers to change, um, you know, to do the right, um, to put in place the right um, frameworks to, to protect people from these harmful practices. These are very difficult to access in many cases um, because of just deep-seated homophobia and very harmful beliefs. So um, these are the challenges we're facing. We want to popularize this data, share it with, with everybody who, who, who can um, make an impact in this area, but also raise awareness about um, what it looks like, um, who's at risk, how are people being violated in this way, and then call on everyone who can contribute to changing the situation everywhere in Africa to do so. And so our effort is really geared at in the regional level, sub-regional level, even national levels to put forward this data to the relevant parties and call for this to stop and to be eradicated and for everybody to play their part in making sure that everybody's safe, everybody is well, and everybody's protected, and everybody enjoys their fundamental human rights, according even to African treaties, African uh, laws, uh, even our national laws and our regional laws. Um, so that, um, that is what we've been uh, trying to move forward. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing. Rushmi, let me bring you into the conversation. Uh, what challenges are you facing? Transgender and medical treatment and employment opportunities is something that Rashmi feels very strongly about. Though there is work being done here, there is still lots more required to help improve acceptance. Specifically, Bollywood is a huge base and platform, not just in India, but globally. The portrayal of the LGBTQIA plus community in modern Bollywood cinema is unacceptable in many ways, though, though there have been a few path-breaking mainstream and non-commercial movies recently, there's still a lot more to be done, keeping in mind the reach of the segment. So those are two areas and challenges that um, Rashmi's advocacy has been focused on. Thank you. Okay, um, as esteemed members of global organizations advocating for change and support for the queer community, what motivates you all to keep fighting? And what could we do as an organization to help? Grachatin, I'm gonna go back to you on this one. Sorry? Hello? Were you able to hear the question? I can, would you like me yeah, to repeat sorry. it? The, the, yeah, yeah, if you could repeat it, sorry. The connection. Sure, no, 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 it's no worries at all. Um, basically, uh, you know, as esteemed members of global organizations advocating for change and support for the queer community, what motivates you to keep fighting? What keeps you going? And what can we do as an organization to help? Wow, um, so if I could be amplified again, if that's okay. Um, the... Um, I mean, I have to say one thing. I acknowledge my privilege a lot. Um, that I don't get to just do a job, but I'm, I'm getting to do something that I'm so passionate about on a day, daily basis. I wake up, I get to go to work, and I get to make do this. But at the same time, we know that it also um, it comes at a cost as well because you're so personally engaged, it comes at a cost 
of um, of your person, of your not just your mental health of yourself, but that of your team as well. Um, I think that's really um, an important point to highlight. I think the sad reality is that you know, as much as we want the world to change by tomorrow, it's not going to. You know, we want to make change and we want to see it happen tomorrow, so we can enjoy it too. Um, I think that's what uh, motivates me. But knowing that that we've got a long way to go, and that there's a very, and we're not, we've only just started. Um, and I think what keeps me motivated as well that is that we we have left people behind. And we say, and I say we by the LGBTI community, we've left our trans siblings, and non-binary and intersex siblings behind. And I think we need to make sure that we're able to give them space to catch up with us and make sure that that's been done. But knowing that we still have a long way to go um, is something that keeps me going. And that at the heart of it, it's not just about marriage equality. It's bigger than that. It's about constitutional equality. It's about reform of economic systems that have kept people behind for years and years and years um, because we do not fit, because not only do we not fit into heteronormativity, which is a capitalist system, um, um, we need to defy that. So that consequently, those we are at odds with that system or that economic model as well. So I think um, here we need, to, there needs to be a more, um, a longer way to go for um, economic justice to happen for our communities. Because yes, we may be able to get married and, um, and you know, have equal rights, but it's not great when we're all going to be living in poverty and the 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 um income inequalities between rich and poor are just widening um i think that's really really important to po po um, point out and i think it's important to remember that um that folks at uh, microsoft remember that that at the heart of this is tax justice is economic justice you know how is you, are you as a corporation ensuring that you are promoting economic justice you are promoting tax justice um that um that you as a corporation are not leaving or damaging uh what is fundamental to our communities which is freedom of association by allowing trade unions to form um by allowing uh which is uh, um very also very important for um um civil society lgbti organizations as well so i think these are the things that motivate me um a lot bit more it's not just about you know making sure that everyone can get married, that's important, but it goes far beyond that, far beyond that. The injustices in our world that are really impacting our LGBTI communities are beyond just marriage equality. Thank you. Thank you. Anya, what about you? What motivates you to keep fighting? And what could we do as an organization to help? Thank you. Um, I think I'll definitely echo uh, Gutartan's uh, sentiments. I mean, until we are all free, none of us are free. I and mean, in, in Africa, where, in country, where there are still countries that criminalize consensual same-sex, uh, where courts are still saying that LGBT people have no right to freedom of association or freedom of expression. Um, in many of our countries, violence is still common place and people have absolutely no recourse. Uh, sometimes even police and authorities are the perpetrators of that violence. So, so many people are so unsafe. And also when I hear the testimonies of survivors of these conversion practices who've been subjected to such cruel and, and, and harmful uh, things, um, just solely based on their sexual orientation, but also just listening to the resilience um, and I mean, it's, it's it's unfair that people have to be that resilient. Um, you know, when you listen to, to their testimonies and their resilience and their continued efforts and fight to Can 
you know, it seems like you might be cutting out a little bit. We want to. No, it seems like you're cutting out a little bit. So let me move on to the next question and we'll check your, your audio. Thank you, though, so much um, for sharing a little bit about what motivates you to keep fighting. Let me turn to my Microsoft employees. Um, can you tell my fellow Microsoft employees, I should say, um, can you tell us about how the corporate environment has uplifted your work and additional steps the company could take to, could take to better support you? And let me start with Rushmi on that one. Rashmi shares, as a proud and vocal ally, Microsoft has not just helped her grow as an individual, but also as a mother, as she is teaching her daughter to be more open, kind, and inclusive. Walking the Pride Parade with her daughter and having her talk to her friends about inclusion gives Rashmi hope for the future. Thank you. Alan, how about you? Thank you. Well, Microsoft focuses in several ways to provide visibility to the LGBTQI plus community, um, to our equity and human rights. There's gender affirming benefits and one of the most amazing employee resource groups, which, by the way, I personally believe has been one of the things that uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me because I have gotten the opportunity to develop things that I normally wouldn't have the chance to develop in my day job. Like leadership, I have the honor of leading nine chapters in the region. I've had the opportunity to work with multidisciplinary people across the entire Latin America. And even today, I'm given the privilege to impact at a worldwide level with this amazing event. And I could give you several examples of how the corporate efforts uplift me and my community, but I'll just finish on a true personal story. Earlier today, the man I called my love for over five years, had to get a surgery that was a complete success, by the way. And thanks to Microsoft's private insurance benefits in Costa Rica, didn't have to wait years to get a spot in the public healthcare system. We were able to access one of the best private hospitals in the country. He got a five-star treatment, and I was able to finish preparing for this event in an amazing waiting room with nice fresh coffee, Wi-Fi, and the certainty that my beloved was in the best hands possible. These type of things makes me feel extremely proud to call myself a Microsoft employee. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for sharing that personal story. George, how about you? You're back on stage. How about you? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I think for Microsoft, as we have read, 100 countries in the world, um, we really need to Look at that. Countries where pink is is great. There are countries where rights are George, I'm so sorry. Your audio is cutting back out again. I want to try really quickly one more time. There ways I, I want to try one more time really quickly. Does it work now? Um, so what I was saying that uh, I, I think uh, if you look at the world, there are countries where being gay is luckily now the ordinary thing. Uh, there are countries where gay rights are a hot topic and Microsoft does really support changes there. There are countries where LGBTQI plus agenda is a taboo or even a criminal offense. What I love about Microsoft is that we're able to differentiate and support our employees in different circumstances. So I'm a very open gay for both that's one. That at least in our office, most people will say, there are always ways to make it better. Uh, and in my experience, what makes Microsoft an outstanding place to work, uh, it's people, my colleagues, who make me feel safe to be who I am. Uh, another thing which I believe is a big role is allies. Uh, and we need to keep investing into education. Uh, we need to help people understand uh, what does allyship mean, how to do it right, uh, and support our colleagues uh, in their journey. Thank you, George. Um, okay, last question, y'all. Um, why, While we are all speaking about the queer experiences in different countries, there are clear themes that cross borders. If we want to push for equity across the globe, we need to work together. 
What are ways we can build coalitions transnationally to address the state of a queer world? George, I'm going to go back to you. Um, since your audio is working really good, I want to make sure we keep you engaged on this conversation. Thank you. And, and I think I will I will finish with where I started. Uh, we need to make everything possible to stop the war. It's very hard to talk about queer rights globally when there is a war or military conflict, be it Ukraine or anywhere else in the world. I think that's fundamental for us. And as soon as we cross that line, we can start doing better things to improve the community, to make it right uh, for everyone else. Work. Thank you, George. Gertotten, how about you? Um, wow. Uh, I think solidarity is very, very much important right now. Um, and again, you know, solidarity uh, to stop all wars, not just one, but there's many wars taking place. There's a war in Yemen, uh, which goes unnoticed. Uh, there's a war in Sudan, um, as well as the war, war in Ukraine. Um, I think that is very, very key. Um, and I think we have to look, the ability to look beyond our, in our own. And I think... <laughs> I mean, just going back to the example Alan gave, it was great that, you know, Microsoft could pay for that surgery, but there's so many millions of people that will, could never work for the Microsofts, right? Um, that could not have that. Otherwise, they're only able to have surgeries in local hospitals. And that includes our own communities. So what do we do in that case? So how do we champion systems of social protection and better social protection so that if you are not in employment or if you're not hired by the Microsoft, you, that you can actually have access to good facilities too, that you don't have to work for Microsoft, or you can work for another organization or corporation, and that you too can deserve and have those uh, entitlements that Microsoft are giving. So I think it's really important that, you know, um, it shouldn't be contingent on your employer, really. I think that's the global solidarity call. That's what's transnational, uh, that we all stand up for one another across systems, really, because, you know, right now the discussion around the labour workforce is that, you know, only 40%, only, sorry, 40% uh, of the global workforce is in formal economy, while 60% of us are in the informal economy. And that includes, and guess what? That's where most LGBTIQ plus people are. So how are we showing solidarity across those movements, I think is really, really important and, and building those movements as well um, and not allowing those divides to happen, uh, be it on race, be it on gender, be it on disability. Um, yeah, I think that an economic justice. Let me give you an example. For, um, last year uh, in Switzerland, there was a referendum and um, a sign uh, for marriage equality. At the same time the referendum was taking place, there was also a referendum for better tax justice, for making sure corporations pay a larger sum or fee of money for what they uh, accumulate in wealth. And speaking to the LGBTI community, they were like, yes, you know, marriage equality. But I was also speaking to, um, you know, many gay men in particular, um, working in big multinationals like Microsoft, saying, would you vote for, how would you vote for the marriage equality? Of course, yes. But how would you vote for this tax reform, which would mean more expenditure for governments or more income for governments to spend on social programs for LGBTIQ plus people living in poverty? Guess what the answer was? The answer was, sadly, why should we help poor people and poor members of our community? So if we can't show solidarity for our own, how are we going to show solidarity across movements? If we can't show solidarity within our own borders for um, LGBTI li people living in poverty, then, you know, I'm, sad, I'm, af I'm afraid that there's a sad, sad state of affairs right now. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, let me bring you back into the conversation. How can we build coalitions transnationally to address the state of a queer world? Wow. <laughs> Such powerful responses from George and Gurchat. <laughs> it's leaving me empty-handed. Policy, policy is certainly the the place to start, and uh, without trying to be redundant in the amazing contributions of uh, uh, George and Gurchat, and 
I will probably try to um, understand each other better, right? Um, I'll give an example with the Latin community. Our language, Spanish, is very male genderized, and we have been trying to take it forward into a more inclusive, uh, gender neutral type of communication style. And when we started to try to dig in um, internally here on what inclusive communication means, we figured out that there are there's just so much more that we need to learn about getting to understand each other and to communicate with each other. And um, there's a misconception that um, you are only one thing in life and that you that you are either LGBT or that you are a trans person or if you are gay or lesbian or whatever. But we, there's just so much more of our identities and of our intersectionality. And um, until we learn to appreciate and celebrate all of them as a whole, and until we learn to um, to create these spaces of human rights for everyone, not just for um, people with disabilities, not just for Afro descendants, not just for indigenous, not just for trans, until we learn that the key is that everyone needs to move forward, then we, we won't really reach that uh, equity. And I think that could start with something as simple as being able to communicate with each other. So I think that if we are able to understand um, the people around us and start, stop judging each other for the smallest or biggest things. And another <laughs> learning from Asia, again, um, stop putting your culture on top of the rest. Like I can't just say, something that might be offensive for someone else. And because it is okay to say it in my country, because it is okay to say it in my community, because I can say it, it, it doesn't make it right, right? So we need to be very conscious on how we talk to others and, and how we communicate. And again, world peace policy should be at the top of the list, but I wanted to definitely add something a little different. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Kanyo, uh, welcome your thoughts on this as well. Thank you. I hope I'm audible this time. Yes, you are. It's Can you perfect. Hear? Fantastic. Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, so I'd say definitely keeping partnerships like this going is very important. We at Outright are very um, grateful for the sustained uh, leadership and support from Microsoft. For example, uh, through the, the COVID-19 Global LGBT Emergency Fund, um, we were able to support so many communities um, all over the continent and beyond. Um, also, just being able to share um, some of our work with uh, employees of Microsoft is very important. Um, and so we, 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 we are grateful that that continues to happen. Um, and all the other sort of um, different ways we have partnered with each other, that's important uh, for practical ways of really um, moving forward. Uh, also, just uh, ensuring as we've moved online, Many of our communities in Africa um, as well have, have uh, you know, the new normal of working online, but that is very unsafe for so many people here. Uh, so just ensuring that online safety as well um, and being intentional about um, that kind of work um, and also staying connected, listening carefully um, to the needs of, of people um, and, and continuing these dialogues just like this is a very important part of the work. Um, and yeah, I'll pause there just before my audio uh, fails me again. Um, thanks. Thank you so much. And last but not least, uh, Rashmi, we welcome your thoughts on how we can build coalitions. Hi, and yes, once again, I will be sharing for Rashmi. What Rashmi shares is, I believe there is a lot to be done to teach the next generation about these basics of inclusion and kindness. In some countries, this is at, far, at a far more advanced stage than others, but I believe this is an audience we need to work with together, irrespective of those borders, boundaries, nationalities, and other dividing lines. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for joining us uh, this afternoon for this wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to turn it over and back to you, Chris and Eleanor. Happy Pride, everybody. Wow. 
Wow. Well, thank you all so much. What an impressive, enlightening panel. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking the time to join with us today. For me, this really serves as a call to action and a reminder to do my part in the spaces I enter and to also remember to celebrate what it means to be part of this diverse LGBTQIA plus community. We have a long way to go as a community, and yet I'm encouraged and inspired by advocates and activists like those from whom we just heard. Now, this brings us to the conclusion of our event today. But as we talked about, pride has no end date, and it most certainly has no borders. We are so glad you were all able to join us today. And I want to take this time to thank every speaker who joined us today, both live and in pre-recorded videos, all the volunteers who put time in, and the amazing team and crew behind this event. I hope you all had fun, learned something new, had a great time, and all of that. So feel free to explore around the space, meet new people, and if you haven't yet had a chance to look at Christopher Street, I definitely recommend it. Happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.